So shall we begin? How many of you were able to finish all the stuff, all the lab exercises and homework? How many finished most? Okay, let's ask. How many finished all the lab but not all the homework? So you had trouble or is just that you didn't have time? If you were not able to do it, let's discuss it in the lab today. Okay. Um, but if it's just because you didn't have time to do it, that's fine. If it's because you didn't understand something, then let's discuss it in the lab. Um, also, feel free to email me. Like if you have a if you have a problem with one thing, just email me. And if it's a problem everyone's having, then I'll add a document explaining it on the drive. It'll make it easy to. Was it the inverse CDF? Did most of you have trouble with the inverse CDF? Yeah. But did all of you do homework? So the reading? No, five and six is today's. Oh, you saw it really late then. Because I put it up only at 1 a.m. or something. Um, so what did I want? So what we'll do today is, initially I'll show you some strategies that are used that are very popular in computer graphics and there's no reason they should only be useful in graphics. Um, but uh, I'll show you some 2D examples. So yeah, these are slides again from our SIGGRAPH course that, uh, so with Wojtek and uh, Okay, so this part I should be able to breeze through now. Um, yeah, we want to calculate the area. So these sampling patterns are going to be essentially this integral gets multiplied by some sampling function. It's very similar to the reconstruction thing, but yesterday we didn't see this for integration. Remember, we looked at aliasing yesterday, and I said you can represent this reconstruction problem as a first the sample signal is a product of the sampling and so on. Now remember, if you have a function f of x and you're sampling it, and you want to get this integral, you cannot, you can't actually get this integral for any arbitrary f. What you can get, some approximation, which is this sample signal. This is what we write, wrote yesterday as f under this, right, fs. And it's f times s, okay. So, and we recall that s of x was your sampling pattern, right? A number of Dirac's, x, k, these are the sampling locations. So most sampling things, all sampling, parameters will be shown in green from now on. The integrand and related things will be shown in, uh, in red. So we have sample locations and we evaluated the integrand at these red locations. What we're going to be talking about now is how do we generate xk? Yesterday we looked at how we can modify the distribution of xk and so on. But for, for now, this morning, we're only going to look at uniform. We only saw one way to generate uniform random numbers, right? Actually, we saw two. One of them was just uniformly random. And the one special way was jittered sampling or stratified sampling. But of course, the simplest thing in 2D is our random sampling. And in MATLAB, it may look different. In C or C++, you may do something like this, right? Where you get samples that are that have a random x and y coordinate. This is really easy to do in high dimension. So obviously, this is uh, a good thing. It is progressive. What progressive means is if you have 100 samples and you realize that your estimate is not good enough and you want to draw 101st sample, then your 101st or 200th or 300th sample can all be added to the same array. And all the properties that were good for the first 100 can also be guaranteed for the 100 plus 100, 200 set. So that means if you have uh, a set S1 of samples, a set S2 of samples, then you can union them and you're guaranteed to have the properties of. Right? And that is 
called usually progressive. This is a good thing because when you want to approximate, remember yesterday I told you this problem of in the animation industry, someone will come and use a fast algorithm and then you know the director or somebody else will approve it and say, oh, that looks good, now let it run. But then they switch algorithms and the, it may have different properties. The advantage of having a progressive sampler is when you do that check, all you're doing is checking it at 100 samples. And then they let it run to 1,000. The algorithm doesn't change. Right? So that's really good because the first 100 samples can still be used and just continue. And again, at 500, you can pause, look at the result, see if it looks good. If it doesn't look good, you know, you can stop. If it looks good, you go ahead and you still use the first 500 samples. So it's efficient. The, the very obvious problem is there are these big gaps, which means if you have a function that is important here, this has a peak here, your samples in this particular realization will completely miss that. And on the next realization, maybe these three samples end up there. And if they do, then you get a very high value. Then the next one may miss it and you'll get a low value. So what will happen is the variance of your estimator, the V of mu will be very large. And we don't want to have a large variance. We want to have a nice tight histogram for the results. And obviously you have clumping which can cause uh, problems. But remember this is still unbiased in that if you take several iterations of these you expect to get the right answer. And yeah, so if we go back to our Fourier transform, right, um, so far we were looking at everything in 1D. I just wrote a hat of omega, right. What I'm, from now on everything is going to have this arrow on top showing that it's actually a vector. And in this particular set of slides, you're going to see 2D examples, but there's no need to restrict ourselves to 2D. You can extend this. And we will, rather than messing it up by showing multiple integrations, we're just going to write D here, which is whatever the domain of integration or the sampling domain, or whatever, it is, whatever the X's domain is, it, it could be higher dimension. So in this case, D will be S cross uh, S, uh, R cross R, but uh, within the unit. Similarly, for uh, the sampling function, we are going to have now s hat of, and we'll have arrows everywhere. Right? So just remember here, in the original one, we just wrote omega x, which is the 1D version. In the higher dimensional version, it's a dot product. And yeah, so this is our sampling function. Okay? We wrote s x here. But remember, s x is a train of Dirac delta. So you can put simply substitute that in here and you simplify it. So what do we have now? We have this Fourier transform S, S hat. Just analytically in terms of exponentials. So one way to do this would have been to take S hat of omega and compute a fast Fourier transform. Right? That's the easy thing to do. But in this case, because they have a train of Dirac's, we can do this analytically. And why can we do this analytically? Because when you integrate, so when you integrate this, the summation will come out, right? It's all linear. The Dirac means that there's a spike at one point. So any integral, if you've done homework yesterday, the convolution of the Gaussian and the Dirac, you should also be able to see that any integral where there's a Dirac will be the integrand evaluated at the shifted Dirac. So maybe that's not so obvious. So what I'm trying to explain is, if I have Can someone tell me what the what this integral is? Huh? Zero? Okay. What is yeah. so what this does is in this case the Dirac function is only at zero, right? At peak. In this case, the Dirac function's peak is at 2. 
that is this x minus two, right? Now, if you multiply this function with any function, so in this case, x squared, it doesn't matter what happens anywhere else. The only thing that matters is that this point x equals two, x squared equals four. So the integral is zero everywhere else except that. So the advantage of having a Dirac in an integral is a good thing. So when you can manipulate integrals to have Dirac's in them, it's a good thing because it kind of removes the need for integration. You can simply evaluate the integrand at whatever the shifted value of the Dirac. Right? So that's all we did in the in the in this expression. We have a number of Dirac's. It's not just one. So we can take the summation out. So it will be integral x1 times this plus integral x2 times this. And each of those integrals, the shift is xk, which means this x, like we replace x squared with 2, we can replace x with xk. Because x is the integration domain, xk is a particular location where the sample is. Which means now we can get analytically the value for s hat. Any questions? Just some manipulation. Then we can start visualizing this spectrum, right? Remember that this is complex, right? In this case, it's very obvious. You have the complex number there. Um, and so we can visualize, for example, the power spectrum, which is what people normally look at, right? Which is the square of the amplitude. And it looks like this. So these are random numbers. Expected, whatever, this is the spectrum you expect for this, right? As you can see, any point in this domain is a frequency variable. And any point in that domain is your sampling variable. And from now on, we'll use colors so it makes things easier. So yeah, if you see green anywhere associated with sampling, if you see purple anywhere. Okay, now remember, this is one realization of samples. We can do many realizations. And for each of them, we'll get some power spectrum. Okay. So what we actually are interested in is some statistics of this spectrum. For example, we looked at the expected sampling spectrum yesterday, and that simply, in this case, average them or integrate them as you like to think about it. So for any set of samples or any, sorry, any sampling strategy, you can associate with it an expected sampling spectrum. And obviously in higher dimensions, it's quite annoying to have to visualize this, right? Maybe the visualization people will take it as a challenge, but for for this purpose, it's quite annoying that you know in two D it's okay, but we go to higher dimensions. So one way people kind of look at this is instead of looking at it as a two D distribution, they look at this circle. At this circle, you have a constant frequency, right? Omega x plus omega y. So x, omega x squared plus omega y squared is constant. So it tells you this is low frequency, this is high frequency, like we did with our image. We drew a circle and removed all the high frequencies. So now we can integrate this expected spectrum around this DC. DC is in the middle, zero. Integrate it in circles. Then you can think of this 1D plot. So at 1, whatever value there is, is the integral at 1 on that circle. So we have basically reduced this 2D expected power spectrum to a 1D plot just for convenience. Frequency is on this axis and this power is on the y axis. Also now we don't have to look at gray and try to distinguish between gray and light gray and so on. We can clearly see what the value is. That's another advantage. Just to remind you, that is the DC peak here. It's negative X frequencies, y, uh, positive X, negative Y, positive Y here. Now, because it's a real function, if you read up about Fourier transforms, a real function has the same, is symmetric about DC. Uh, the spectrum is symmetric about DC, so we don't really need to even see the negative half. Right? We can simply look at that. Also, in this case, we don't have any negatives because we only integrated circles, right? So there is only the radius of each circle, which is opposed. Questions? So this is every angular region, what is the integral? No, just the circle, just the circle. Because if you take the entire region, then you're saying 
at each point how much energy is contained in all these frequencies. I don't want that. I just want to know at each frequency, like we did with the Fourier transform, we want to know at each frequency how much energy there is. Okay? So, yeah, this we are not integrating in the disk, just the lines, which is a contour. Okay, that's the DC thing. Anyway, so the important thing is we have a sampling strategy. We have something called an expected spectrum. We have a plot. Which is the, for now, we don't need to learn to interpret this. But a, an obvious thing that comes out of this is if we have purely random samples, then there is no bias towards any particular frequency. These samples are all frequencies. OK, so for regular sampling, which means I'm going to take a regular grid, or samples look like this. I don't really need to go into the details. Again, you can do this in high dimensions, but what happens? Can anyone remember what happens in higher dimensions with this? Sorry? Jumps where? No, no, so that was different. So I'm saying if this is 2D, if I want to do 3D or 4D, I'm not talking about linearizing. The number of samples increase. Like, so if, if you have four samples in 1D, 16 in 2D, in D dimension, you have four to the power D. So if you start sampling along any dimension by a large value, then by the time you reach d equals 100, you may you may run out of uh, memory or something. Okay? So that's called the curse of dimensionality. When when you're not able to tune this for high dimensional things. Also remember this causes aliasing if you're single. So if you remember yesterday, we had these white Gaussians with the spikes, and if the samples are regular, then you get back a Dirac comb. And if there's aliasing, then you get structured artifacts because each of these bands gives you, at the exact same point, they all overlap, right? So actually, if you like camping uh, and if you use sleeping bags or if you have a tent, one thing they tell you is uh, when you fold it, you shouldn't always fold it the same way because then it tends to form creases which tear, right? So you can think of it like that, is that every fold introduces something even though your fold may be the fourth fold, there may be an overlap. With, so it's sort of a periodic thing, right? And that causes a weakness in your sleeping bag tent or whatever. In fact, what they advise you to do is just put it in randomly. Just keep pushing it in till it. Because then every time you put it in, it comes in. So that's what happens with stochastic sampling. So here with structured sampling, all these different bands, these higher frequencies, if the function is not band limited, they all contribute here and they may accumulate in a very structured way. And that is what caused those very visually disturbing um, sort of artifacts when I showed you this black and white curved image. And I sampled it only with three by three pixels. So that is one problem with regular sampling. And again, this has to do with the perceptual metric. We are not tuned to uh, enjoy these things. Jitter is obviously a straightforward extension, right? You take this regular grid and each in each cell in the grid gets pushed by some random value within the grid. So the nice thing about jittered sampling is we can prove that it does not increase variance. It doesn't always help. It does not increase variance. And again, it extends to higher dimension, but it has the same problem. Because we have this grid structure, we will end up with exactly the same problem. It's slightly better than grid because if you want to, so in 2D, if you want 12 samples, how will you do it? So the problem with curse of, so the, the curse of dimensionality says that if you're in 2D, the regular grid requires 16 samples if you want four, right? But in stratified or jittered sampling, you can do it without. So if I want to only get 10 samples in 2D, how will I do it? How can I generate 10 samples in 2D of jittered? Do you have any ideas? So I want an unbiased estimator 
with jittered sampling with 10 samples in 2D. There are many ways you can do it. Tell me any one. Yeah, that's one easy way to do it. Is you have 16, but you're not forced to sample everyone. If you only choose to sample these 10, then you will always end up with gaps here, which will give you a bias. But if you just choose randomly any 10, and you draw a sample there, then you're fine. Because the problem with that is you may choose randomly two bins again. You may choose the same bin twice, which is not a bias, but you don't have the gain of stratifying, right? So it is not a problem, but it introduces variance. So usually there's this trade-off between bias and variance. If you increase bias, sometimes you can decrease variance Some, and the other way around. Um, another strategy could be that nobody forced me to have four by four. I could have two by five strata, and I can get ten. And that may be better than having choosing that. So there are many strategies you can apply. So at least with jittered, you can play around with these numbers. But with um, with the grid, you can't really do that. Right? Again, it's not progressive. So if I've given you 16 samples and you say, okay, give me another 10, then I have to re-stratify for 20, 26, right? I cannot simply take another 10. I can, and it will still be unbiased, but we have the same problem. You may choose the same 10 again, right? Which is not really stratifying. So the benefit of stratification is not uh, achieved when you do progressively. Uh, when you progressively sample. However, the spectrum looks interestingly different. So even though these are still random samples, uniform, unbiased estimator, you see the spectrum now has this big shadow here in the middle, right, around DC. So if we return to our 1D plot, there is no energy in the low frequencies. Is that good or bad? Someone take a guess. There are two options. The easiest thing is just randomly pick one. So when we look just now at jittered sampling spectrum, we saw this. This is good or bad? If you go, so go back to yesterday's discussion, right? What we said was, when we convolve this Dirac comb with the sampling spectrum, if the sampling spectrum is like this, then what happens at each point? Instead of this Dirac comb, which was the sampling spectrum with regular sampling, now we have so this is this pertains to Vijay's question yesterday as well, right? So that when we use stochastic sampling, uh, if we use random sampling, then you have a flat spectrum. If we use jittered sampling, you have this spectrum. Now remember that this is something like this, right? When we had the spikes yesterday, what we said was we didn't want this spikes copy to interfere with. So we did not want this overlap, correct? Because that was causing alias. Now, if we have no energy here in this part of the space, that means it's very less, it's less likely that there'll be interference. So the further away we can push this, the better. Because that means that the alias copies of the spectrum that are in this region will be downweighted because this power is very low here. Is that clear? Now this is the big difference between um, 
random and jittered. For random, we had uniform, just random samples, we had this flat. When you have this flat, there are alias copies due to all of these intersecting, right? So it becomes very hard to reconstruct. So this actually, thinking about it, it explains what why stochastic sampling is not used much in signal processing. What happens is, because when you, as soon as you introduce randomness, you start getting energy here. Whereas if you had a sequence of spikes, like a direct delta, then you know there's zero, then there's a delta, there's zero, there's delta. But the problem with that is that because the deltas are regular, they start causing these structured artifacts in this space. But at least if your signal is band limited, you can push that delta so far that it doesn't bother you. You can apply a low pass again. Whereas with stochastic sampling, if you use random samples, then this area can never be removed. So you will always have aliasing, but it won't be aliasing, it'll be in the form of noise. Okay. However, with jittered sampling, this thing, the low energy area gets removed. And that's that explains why this sort of pattern is good for signal reconstruction. Yeah. This is good. Yeah, but so does uh, regular sampling. In fact, regular sampling has zero, then a spike. Zero, then a spike. Right? That even this has. Everything has DC. Because the spike at zero is the integral of your S of X. Your S of X does not integrate to zero. It integrates to one. All of them have a spike at zero, which is one. And that is the component you want. Right? So there's always a spike here. And there's a copy of that. Yeah. So if you look in my figure here. There is always something. So this is at zero, right? And you can see I've drawn this here. This, And that's the one we want. So if we do a band pass, then we get the actual signal back. If this was not there, then you don't reconstruct any signal. So there's always a DC spike. But the problem with stochastic sampling is there are also some values here. Just keep this in mind. We'll come back to this. And that's why this spectrum is giving us a lot of information, right? For reconstruction, we are able to understand just by looking at this, whether it will be good or not for certain signals. Okay, remember, that was independent random. So just to give you an idea of how it improves things, here we have a sphere, and we're doing this light transport estimation. So in this case, there's no fancy stuff. There's some emitter which is emitting photons. And we are seeing how many photons arrive at each of the virtual pixels. And we are running a simulation. Okay? We, in this case, it's just 16 random samples at each point to integrate. And we see that without increasing the number of samples, you see there's noise here, obviously. Right? You see the variance as sort of this graininess. Now, without increasing the computational cost, really, just by changing the sampling pattern, it looks smoother, right? That's the zoom in of this, in case you can't see the noise. Light integration. So this is what we saw earlier, right? This light transport integral and you have all that. So we're integrating at each point, first of all, how much light gets there. Now remember, at these points, it's actually a very complex integral, a very complicated integral. Because some rays will be in shadow, some will not. So you actually have an integrand which is which has a step function in it. The step function is zero when the sphere blocks the photon, and one when the sphere doesn't block it. Right? So it's actually that is one of the reasons why we use Monte Carlo. Because for Monte Carlo integration, all you need to be able to do is evaluate the integrand. Whereas when you do things analytically, you need to be able to open it out, express it in terms of some polynomials or so on. So the minute you have high dimensional step functions, so this is over S, the hemisphere. So if you think about it, it looks like this, right? It looks like this. There is something, there's a point here. Let's say, in this case, I'll draw it slightly differently. Let's say there is a light source here emitting photons. Okay, you're asking, do any of the photons make it here? Okay. 
In this case, do any photons make it to that point P? This is the photon. Do any photons arrive at P in this case? Does anyone think there's a photon arriving at P? So there could be a photon. It may arrive here. So long. Photons can arrive at P, but not directly from the light source. Okay. Now, if you take this point here, even directly, you see that some photons will make it through, some photons will get blocked, blocked from this side. Right? So if you look at this integral over angle here, you will have a function that looks like this. Right? So this is a zoom in on that. You will have some high value in this region, low value here, zero. Right? So the function looks like this. And if you open it out over theta, it may look something like this. Right? So it's actually a, it's not a band limited signal at all, first of all. Uh, secondly, it gets even more complicated in, in uh, over the sphere. Right? When you have a sphere, then you have something like this. And remember, you could have another sphere here. Right? There's no reason we should only have one sphere. In which case, you get these really sort of unwieldy signals. It's got holes in it. It's got all sorts of things in it, right? And if you think of the space of rays, it gets sort of, the, the space is not a nice space. There's holes in it. Where everywhere there's an occlusion, there's a hole. Okay? And to integrate this analytically would be hopeless because if I find some way to do this and somebody changes the sphere to a triangle uh, or a cube, then again I have to read it away. The nice beauty about Monte Carlo is you don't care about anything. You simply throw a photon, count how many hits there in it, right? But then the problem is you have to use some number of samples, right? Here what we're seeing is after doing that counting, we're seeing how many make it and so on. So this is like your histograms where if you make the bins of the histograms very narrow, then you saw a lot of noise. Or if you increase the number of decrease the number of samples instead of a thousand n, you give 16 n. Suddenly you saw it was noisy, right? So in this case, n is 16, and you see it's noisy. Instead of visualizing it as a histogram, here we visualize it as brightness on a pixel. That's it. Okay. And you can zoom in and see this, right? Ah, yes. Good question. So the question is, how many bounces are we looking at? So in this case, we fixed it. I think it was two. And that is why you see that even in the very black area, sometimes there'll be one little speck because some photon made it. And the, the larger the depth, the more noise you start seeing. Because that means you increase the dimensionality of the integrand, but you're only still using 16 samples. So you'll get very high variance. So this is a problem because the number of samples here dictates the quality of the image. Now, if you, if you pay money and you go watch one of these big blockbuster movies, and your images, the CG in that looks like this. No one's going to be happy, right? So most of these companies, they, they generate millions of samples to make sure that you don't see any of this. Because the minute you see this, people tend to think, oh, wait, that doesn't look real. We don't really see this in real life. In fact, uh, the funny thing is our visual systems eliminate this for us. And it's peculiar that they don't eliminate it in this case. So if you go into a dark room, actually the image recorded at the back of, back of the retina has a lot of noise, but the brain filters it out somehow. And we end up seeing, even in a dark room, we, we end up seeing pretty smoothly. However, if you take a photo in a dark room and then look at the photo later, your brain doesn't analyze it the same. So it's a very peculiar thing about our system. Right? So yeah, so in CG, the one of the big goals is let's remove all of these speckles because people detect it as being fake. And it's, However, these speckles are still better than those banded artifacts I showed you with the ball, right, moving bias. So people said, okay, we prefer speckles over those artifacts. So we will use stochastic sampling, but we want to improve it by choosing appropriate strategies. And we said, yeah, you know, in, in CG, the high dimensions are, you may want to integrate over the pixel, as we saw before, average multi-sampling. You may want to integrate over a lens, over motion blur, and all this, you see now. 
and the number of samples grows really uh, quickly for large questions no this should all be easy so there were uh, many variants i'll show you quickly some of them people started thinking about okay now how can we remove this low frequency component and have a fast algorithm that maybe is progressive and what they said so we came up with two strategies right one of them was to arbitrarily choose some other, then i suggested stratify two times five here's another solution that someone came up with. what they did was if you want a 2d um, uh, if you want a jitter in 5d instead of jittering in 5d where if you take two sample strata in each dimensions you already have two to the five so you can't really sample with coarse, uh, with fine granularity. What they did was they stratified in 2D, stratified the other 2D, stratified the 1D. Okay, So you have a 5D space, and they stratified the dimensions, subspaces, 2D subspaces, and one 1D subspaces. So 2 plus 2 dimensions plus 1 dimensions, 5. And then what they did, they started combining them. So they used this strata with some other strata here with this as one 5D sample. So they picked combinations of these and hoped it would be better. Again, if you were thinking about this in 1982, you might have come up with a solution like that. Right? It's not really that complicated a solution, but it's a very popular technique. And part of the reasons these guys were able to come up, so for example, Rob Cook came up with this, was because they had been thinking a lot about this analysis and they could show that this has many benefits. So if this is the reference. Let's say that is what you would get if you use millions of samples. When you used a few random samples, you see this kind of thing. Whereas when we used this algorithm here, we're able to get this, the same number of samples. So as you can see, this suddenly became very interesting to, this was in 84, right? The animation industry. And they started asking questions like, oh, if we can do this, that means we can render these images much faster. OK, so uh, another way you can do this is yeah, what, what we said before. There are five dimensions. We now, not only st now we don't stratify two, two, and one. We stratify every dimension independently, which is very easy. Right? You can do it for any number of samples. So now if you want 18 samples, it's easy. Each gets 18. If you want 20 samples, each gets 20. You stratify in each. Problem is, stratifying in each is maybe not sufficient. We'll see that. Now, if you stratify in each, here I've shown a green dot in each stratum. They're all stratified. But the problem is, now if you take this sample, x1, y1, u1, v1, t1, that's one five-dimensional sample. What is the problem with this sample? It is only in one part of the domain, right? It's in this one corner space. It's not sampling. So one thing you could do is you could just shuffle each of these rows, permute them. Then suddenly you combine x1 with y4, u3, whatever, some random. So you went from here, performed a permute on each. Now you can take each of these samples. It's hard to imagine. So let's think of it in, in, one, in 2D. So these are the two dimensions. It would look something like this. This is also called n rook sampling because if you play chess and imagine each of this is a rook, a rook threatens anything on this row or this column. So the, this is called n rooks because it, it places n rooks in an n by n checker without any rook threatening another. Okay? And uh, this is exactly what we did here. This algorithm generates n rook patterns. What is the advantage of this? Is it? This is the algorithm. Okay, one one simple simple way you can add this, uh, achieve this is first you put all the samples here, right, and then you just shuffle each dimension independently. It's exactly what we should. Okay, so I won't dwell on this. Sh shuffle the rows, then shuffle the columns, and you end up with n rows. What is the advantage of this? The advantage is now in every column you only have, you know you have one sample. For sure. So it's not just uniformly distributed. You know that, yes, it's uniformly distributed in these boxes, 
but you know that it, you definitely have a sample. There's a guarantee. Similarly, around the columns, you are guaranteed to have one sample. What is the problem with it? Yeah, you see there's a massive gap, right? And that's because we have done all this stratification in 1D. We have no idea about correlations or what the gap. So again, this is un uncorrelated. Once you introduce correlations, maybe you can place it in 2D. But once you introduce correlation, there are other problems. So yeah, this is a problem. So you, just when we thought we had an awesome solution, something is not so good about it. Let's see what the spectrum looks like. Actually, this is quite disappointing, right? The spectrum has a lot of energy here. And people came up with other schemes, like multi-jitter. So they combined jitter and this method we talked about. So they took strata. And in each stratum, they generated one sample while also satisfying the constraint that overall, in this n by n checker, you have n rooks. Okay. There's an algorithm for it. I, I've just, I, I mean, I'm going to skip that. But is the is the approach clear? Right. So now you're hoping that you get the benefit of stratific stratification and the benefit of n rooks, because what this means is you shuffle the x coordinates and you shuffle the y coordinates after you generated your stratified sample, okay? And if you project it down, you see that we get the benefits of both. Now it's fairly evenly distributed in 2D. And the power spectrum looks quite good, actually. So remember this, see this low frequency bit with the previous most quite a lot of energy there, which means you're going to corrupt the signal. Whereas with, yeah, so this is jittered, and roots and multi -jittered. So multi-jittered is almost as good as jittered. Exactly, yeah. Oh, no, so not via the inverse CDF. So the hemisphere is a domain change, not a distribution change. Actually, that's a good question. I mean, the effect is not very different, but uh, the analysis is different. So if you, yeah, good question, right? So all this time, we're talking about generating samples on the, oh, actually, let's take a 1D example. So let's say we want to generate a 1D domain, 0 to 1. We've been generating samples here, right? Now I ask you, uniformly sample a circle. How would you sample points uniformly on this circle? The easiest thing to do would be maybe any point on the circle has r cos theta, r sine theta, right? So if your r is 1, then you do theta uniformly in 0. Is this uniform over the circle? How, how will you prove that? Because remember, this is theta, right? So what does it mean to be uniform over the theta? That you get uniform steps, right? So if you get two different thetas, It is non-trivial, even though it may be true, to verify whether this being uniform results in a uniform distribution here. Because you have a sinusoid involved in, or a cosinusoid or something. If you can show that this arc length is only a linear, linearly dependent on theta, then you can prove that is uniform over this, right? So what is the arc length here? Does anyone remember? In this case, it's linear in theta. So that's how you prove in this case that if you generate uniform samples, you get uniformly distributed. Okay, now let's go to the sphere. Can someone tell me an algorithm?
to go from unit square. So these are the samples we have. To let's just take sphere rather than hemisphere. How can we map this point to the sphere? So we have x1, x2 are the two samples. So x1, x2 are the two dimensions. x is x1, x2. Let's call this y. How do I calculate y from x1 and x2 or from x? Let's say the radius of the sphere is 1. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do that. Um, which is harder to visualize. So let me see if I can go one step lower first, and then I'll maybe just explain the intuition of the 3D. So let's do this. Now, instead of the circle, we want to sample the disk. Still 2D now. So now we have Y here, and we have X here. How can I generate Y? It's easier to draw and imagine. How do I generate Y in this case? I have x random in the unit square. I want y random in the unit disk. Should be easy. You want to use parametric. And you have theta. And now you have r, right? So y is r theta. x is x1, x2. How do we map from x, y, x to y now? You could maybe simply say y is x1, x2, right? So you can draw a random variable for r, draw a random variable for theta, you get a point. Does that give you uniform samples? No? Why? If r and theta are both uniform, why will this not give you uniform samples? Because if you look at the arc length covered, as we saw before, is r times theta, right? So if your r happens to be low, then your theta values may be uniform, but they're not, they're all going to be very close to each other. They're going to be close, the density is high. Whereas if your r is large, they're going to be far apart. So if you do exactly the same, use exactly the same distribution for large r and small r, it's not going to work. You're going to get more points in the center of the disk than outside. Okay? So this mapping from the unit square to the unit disk creates a walk. It is still uniform distribution. So we're not touch the distribution, but just the change of domain. So what you need to do is take this mapping, account for the Jacobian of the mapping, right? And then invert it. And like we did with the series, so you get one over one. So we treat it as a mapping, but even though it's not a distribution. If you think of the distribution as being a mapping. So now if you want a distribution on this, then you have to do both. Do the mapping and you have to do this. Anyway, so now let's go back to this example here. Um, yeah, so although you see all of these samples here, in practice, what happens is they get pushed through a mapping for the sphere at each dimension. So the mapping actually is some really complicated mapping. Um, and then, if even if the samples look really good here, actually right now, nobody can guarantee that the mapping is good. It keeps it good. So a lot of this analysis people have been doing for years now on the unit square. But really nobody knows once you push everything through, all the mappings and the densities, that these samples actually remain good. So that's one of the areas that I'm actively working in. I have a student and I, I'm collaborating on another project. So actually, that's these guys, Wojtek and Gopreet and so on. 
that's that was the project we started collaborating with, and we thought maybe we should first understand this stuff. So we did this as a course to understand. So this is an interesting algorithm. Okay, let's let's see. Okay, so the whole point here was we said there are very large gaps. We want to remove the gaps. And we said, oh, if points are too close to each other, that's also not good because if the two points are close to each other, there's likely going to be a gap somewhere else. And this low frequency business, we said we don't want stuff low frequency, right? Which means we want things somewhat equally distributed. But we don't want the spectrum to be equally distributed. Very complicated setup. So somebody had an idea. They said, okay, let's just do this. Let's draw one sample at a time. Okay. And then we will draw, keep drawing samples as though we're throwing darts. Anytime a sample falls within some distance of already existing sample, we reject it. Like rejection sample. Okay. And you keep doing this. In the end, you will have very nicely distributed samples. And it turns out it has amazing spectral properties. So that's what the spectrum looks like. Okay, it's very low here. People were very excited by this. Actually, the way they discovered this was there was a biologist who opened up a monkey's eye and he was looking at the sensors on the monkey's eye. And he, op he observed that they were in some peculiar fashion. Okay? And he was trying to analyze what it was. So he took them and he looked at the spectrum. He got this spectrum. I was wondering why does it have this spectrum and then he looked at uh, this Nyquist theorem and all the signal processing stuff and then they realized oh it's because this low frequency component is totally gone and then they were wondering why we couldn't just why the monkey didn't just have receptors on a regular grid they realized that if we have that and we have aliasing you will be very con the monkey would be very confused because it may see alias thing bands so if you see a band, then you're not sure whether the object is here or here. You just see the band. Whereas in this case, you see it as noise. So you will have an idea of where the object is, which probably was good for evolution. So they did all this stuff. And they were like, oh, that means there is something nice about this, which generates this spectrum. And they found that there was something called this minimum distance. And the point process of people who do maths, mathematical analysis on point processes, they've known this as well. That if your samples can guarantee a minimum distance, then you end up with many nice properties. But they said the easiest way to generate this is by explicitly making sure that no two samples are close. Problem with this is, you don't know, if, you, if I tell you to draw 10 samples, it's not obvious to determine the radius for any domain. So if, if you stop after this, right, if you, if you draw only three samples, then you may get a big gap here because you've used the wrong radius. If I tell you 100 samples, then the radius needs to be much smaller. So there's no easy way to determine the radius. More importantly, now this is correlated, right? Every sample you take depends on all the previous samples. So analyzing this is very, very difficult, and I don't think there's a good analysis of this yet. So this, if you look at it, it looks like there's more energy in some band. So people who look at spectral bands, they call them by colors. So if you have equal energy in all, just like white light, people call them white. So you have white noise, means you have black spectra. In this case, because it was in the middle, closer to the blue wavelength as they thought, they said we'll call it blue noise. Until today, a lot of papers call it blue noise, which is very confusing. And then people came up with better algorithms to generate blue noise, where if you remember previously, there was a little flat area there. They improved it, made sure it was zero. Compared to Poisson disk, this CC, CCVT sampling, you can see the images. You can see the samples actually look really nice. There's no reason we want the samples to look nice, right? All we want is this to go away, and it does. Any questions so far? Yes, in 2D. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, true. You can do that. 
Well, you need to be careful, right? So, I see what you're saying. Ooh, where did that go? Yeah, so the suggestion is... The suggestion is... That let's say we take a... I understand you're saying there's a 4x4 four four grid. So far, we were jittering each grid point within this cell. What you're suggesting now is instead of that, we only jitter it half or some small value. So the samples will be in that stratum, but only in the middle. Is that your suggestion? Well, the problem is there are parts of the domain that you will never sample. So this is guaranteed to be biased. You see what I mean? If your integrand has all its energy in this region, no matter how many realizations of this you take, you're never going to hit that entity, right? Which means it's systematically biased in that. So one thing you could think of then is move this and then sell sample as well, but then you lose the advantage. So as you can see, this is a classic example of how easy it is to come up with an algorithm, but how hard it is to prove that this algorithm has good properties. In fact, this this exists. Um, this is called box data. Okay. And people do this. And as I said, there's sometimes a trade-off between bias and variance. So if you don't really care about bias, then box data. Okay, so in summary, what we've seen now is that when we have samples, we don't want these large gaps. But we've not seen how we can take a sampling strategy and identify whether it's a good one or a bad one. So far, we've gone on intuition, right? So looking at the sampling strategy, how could you guess whether it's good or bad? How will you know what the largest gap is? Standard deviation of what? Standard deviation of what? All of them are uniformly distributed here. Yeah? One thing you could do is you could see what the largest circle you can put in there is without any samples. That could be one arbitrary measure. So what is the largest circle I can put? in one realization. Then you take another realization, you see what is the largest circle, and so on. One way people do this is by defining something, uh, defining a measure of quality, which is called equidistribution, which means we have We've been looking at this all the time. I never told you what it's called. We want it to be equally distributed somehow, even though the distribution is uniform. Want it to be. Okay, so now the question is, how are we going to measure this, right? We know that if we take an arbitrary rectangle R of area R, and this is the unit square, let's call it area A equals one. And if we sample N there, we will expect N1 sample. Let's say there are N1 samples in R, we expect that N1 divided by N equals R divided by A. We looked at this, this is how pi was calculated. However, in practice, this may not be true for a single realization, right? So one thing we could do is simply do R divided by A minus N1 divided by N. We expect this to be zero, but each realization may give you some value. So if you look at the difference between the expected number of samples and the actual number of samples, you get some idea of whether it's good or bad. If this is a very large number, then it means it is bad. Okay. So if you plot this, and this is called discrepancy. The discrepancy between what you expect and what you actually see. 
Now that's a good measure. It's a good, it's a reasonable measure, but it's very useful because somebody proved important properties about it. We could have done the circle algorithm, but no one's really proven any properties about it. This one, people have proven many properties about it, and it's a widely used measure. Instead of taking just that, people look at max, which means you take one realization from a strategy, computer discrepancy, take another realization, computer discrepancy, which is maximum, keep that, keep doing that. So if you have a thousand realizations, you would have kept the maximum discrepancy that you would have seen, right? Now that you take another sampling strategy, thousand realizations, calculate the max discrepancy. The one which has a lower max discrepancy is expected to be the better sampling one, okay? So we want low discrepancy, not high. Once this measure was proposed, people started talking about Oh, wait a minute. If we know that we want this measure to be low, why don't we design a sampling strategy that will give us this? And these approaches are called low discrepancy sampling. And their goal is simply to minimize that. So they don't care about anything else now. You remember so far we were trying to see how to stratify, how to do this. They said we're going to forget about everything because this theorem, there's an inequality. It's called the Koksma Hlavska inequality, which tells you that if your discrepancy is lower than a certain amount, then the integration error is bound by something. Okay, they said, oh, this is a really good news because then I'm not going to care about anything else, whether the spectrum is good or whether we have equal distribution. I'm just going to look at low discrepancy. I'm not even going to care about whether the method is biased or unbiased. Just going to design samples that will necessarily give me low discrepancy. And they don't even need to be stochastic anymore. They can be deterministic. I can find a deterministic set of points that give me low discrepancy. And thanks to the theorem, I know that that is going to give me low integration error. Okay? And this whole field is called quasi Monte Carlo. You might have heard about it. Because instead of pseudo random numbers, they use quasi random numbers, which are deterministic, but look or appear random. Quant quasi Monte Carlo, rather than just Monte Carlo. Instead of MC, it's QMC. So right now there's a merge between these. So most of the conferences in this area will be MCQMC. So it's Monte Carlo and quasi Monte Carlo. Because the main dis difference is in how you get the set of points. In one case is um, deterministic and the other case, uh, sorry, uh, quasi random and the other case is pseudo random. Here's a very simple algorithm. Again, if you were born uh, in that time and you thought about this problem, perhaps even you would have come up with this. And it's named after this uh, Van de Corput. And the idea is you take k equals 1, 2, 3. We're going to take xk. For each k, we're going to write down its base 2 number, right? So in this case, yeah, we have its base 2 number there. 1, the base 2 number, binary is 1. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this binary number, write it here, but flip it. So if we have 1, that doesn't change. If we had 1, 0, we'll write it as 0, 1. Remember, this algorithm is thoughtless. You don't need to analyze it or do anything. Uh, how he came up with it is a different issue. But you have two binary. You represent it, flip it, put it here. Okay, And this is the radical inverse. Okay. And if you look at this value, in real terms, it is half, 1, 4, and so on. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to Look at this part of this plot, uh, this slide. The 0 to 1, in this case, half. So I'm going to put my first sample down at half. Next one is 1 fourth. I put my next sample at 1 fourth. Next is 3 fourth. Right. Then you get 1 eighth, 5 eighths, 3 eighths, and you get samples. Now, if you look at this, this is a regular pattern. But the way we generated this pattern was using this sequence. Well, obviously, this sequence is not good enough. Because if we simply use this sequence, we will end up getting a regular grid. It is regular. It's just a way in which we came up with the sequence was progressive. So we could have stopped at any point, And we know that in the limit, we're going to get some deal. This is useless, because in the end, we get a regular grid. But people use this theory to develop more clever algorithms. So, for example, Halton, so, yeah, just remember that this is the radical inverse in base 2, B, base B. 
So in this case, B equals 2. If it was base 3, then you would use the base 3 representations here and flip it. Everything else would be the same, but the points would be located at different locations. So what Halton said was, oh, look, if we take different bases in each dimension, so in this case, we saw 1D sample, base 2. If I want to sample in 2D, I could take base 2 along this dimension and base 3 along this dimension. For example, if it's high dimension, I could take a different base in each dimension. As you can see, computing this, writing an algorithm to compute this is going to be trivial. Right? Very straightforward. It's a fixed transformation. And you can do that very fast. You can generate it independently for each dimension. And Halton said, if the bases are all relatively prime, then you get interesting patterns. This is where analysis comes in. And they showed that this means you can now progressively generate samples with very well-specified discrepancy bounds. Therefore, bounds on the error. And Hammersley found it uh, almost around the same time, but with a slightly different construction. So he said, well, let's keep the first dimension as regular. And you avoid calculating. If you notice that in one dimension, it was regular anyway. So why bother calculating this at all? Uh, his idea was we'll just do this regular grid on the first dimension and every other dimension we're going to do this. So they're very similar patterns. Well, they're similar in idea, but they generate very different uh, uh, patterns with very different properties. Well, so the, the, the problem here is we need to know n. Okay? I don't know. It's not, it's not really incremental. So actually, interestingly, in this case, they plot. In this case, if you plot Hammersley samples, it turns out to have this very nice property that it is stratified, like we saw before. This multi jetter it, it had so provably you can show this, and there is one in every stratum, but that's not all. It also has one in every stratum in different. So there are many different stratifications possible for the same sampling set, which gives it a lot of power. Okay, so now let's see how good that is. There's your random samples. There's your jittered samples. There's your low distance. So from jitter, it's an improvement. Right? It's all the same number of samples. But there's a bigger underlying improvement that now you have a deterministic sequence, extremely fast to compute in any high dimensional space, is progressive. So this is really the state of the art in computer graphics. Even though the sampling sequence is known for a long time, this has not been improved yet. So there's a scope to improve it. And all most studios would like to use this, but they don't. They don't because the guy who invented this sold it to uh, NVIDIA. He sold it to a company and they patented it, so nobody can use it. <laughs> so the guy was an academic, a uh, very brilliant guy. He still does a lot of research. On that. And um, it's really a silly example of how legalities change things because this has been known far before even he was born, right? But the fact that he used it to render in graphics was patented. So anyone can use low discrepancy sequences, but if they use low discrepancy for rendering, now they have to pay a, a royalty to the company, which is really strange. Anyway, so the, the thing is now all studios in the world are looking for a sampling strategy where they can achieve similar error without having to pay royalty. So actually this is kind of an interest, interesting time because um, the Government research doesn't necessarily want to support this because they feel state of the art has been reached. Whereas industry is very keen to find a solution so that they don't lose. Ah, thanks. So the low discrepancy sampling is very old. I think it's more than 50. So in graphics, I think maybe 90, it must be around. Yeah, 20, 25 years. Yeah. Yeah, 30 years, 30 years. So 
till last year people were saying you know at 30 you can use the patent but i think he didn't patent it till later so he came up with it he published it and so on then he had a startup and when he did the startup he had this bright idea he was like oh i can patent this and of course it paid off right so he did the startup he patented the idea and actually the fun yeah so again it's strange because it's not like he came up with it he just used it and yet he was able to patent the usage and and because of that he's a multi-millionaire now right and um, he sold his company to a bigger company and kept usage rights uh this guy alex keller and the company i think is nvidia that he sold he had a company called mental ray and then that sold Menta Ray, and it sold to nvidia and so now right now nvidia is sitting pretty because anyone who wants to render anything with this will have to pay them royalty keller k-e-l-l-e-r and um, if you look at disney and all these other big companies they were like look we're not going to pay you royalty so what they did is they went and set up a render farm with 30,000 computers, each with, I don't know, like 24 cores or something. So they have now hundreds of thousands of cores. They said, we will just use the older algorithms. We will just use more samples. Because at some point, you have to weigh whether paying the royalty pays off. right? So NVIDIA is now starting to actively see how to price it so that people will trade off energy and maintenance and all this stuff. So this whole thing became a big, a big battle. Anyway, that's just a side story. But yeah, so the, the idea is you can get very interesting deterministic sampling methods that work really well. So yeah, there's the references. So if you look, so this is the, the guy. This was a SIGGRAPH course. If you look at this course, you'll find all the references. Uh, I would say it's actually a very readable course. If you look through this, you'll get a very good idea of uh, what quasi Monte Carlo's and a lot of people in the Monte Carlo community originally pushed off pushed away the quasi Monte community because they felt they were they were breaking you know uh, purist purist or puritan views of uh, of using stochastic and they went to deterministic they were like oh quasi Monte Carlo is biased we don't care about it. this course will explain why bias is not a big deal in many applications uh, and why quasi Monte Carlo is actually very useful. So in the early part of my PhD, uh, we're going to break the coffee. In the early part of my PhD, uh, I suffered a lot because of this, because my supervisor was a very hardcore Monte Carlo person. And there were many people like that in the community. And any paper I sent on Monte Carlo would get rejected. Because they will simply come back saying, use QMC. Because by then they had proved all this bound, shown that it was good for rendering. And it was a real pain to convince them that in some cases you may not want to use QMC. And right now it's much better, but it's still the same problem. If you send a Monte Carlo paper, somebody in QMC will say, oh, why are you doing all this? Just use QMC. But if you look through the analysis of QMC, it's very, very difficult. There are only maybe a, a dozen people in the world who can right now do this analysis for applications. I mean, of course, there are mathematicians who do it all the time, but for applications. So it's a bit strange now that